Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 19th episode, our guest is Bryn Greenwood. But before we get to that, I need to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor. For you, the listeners of the Rob Burgess Show podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. A book I would personally recommend that pertains to this episode is All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by today's guest, Bryn Greenwood. The unabridged audiobook is over 11 hours long and is read by Georgiana Marie. It is set to be released August 9th. Whatever book you pick, you can exchange it at any time. You can cancel at any time, and the books are yours to keep. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show for your free audiobook. Please consider supporting those who support the show, like Audible. You'll be helping me out, and it won't cost you a thing. Another totally free way you can help the show is to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available. Whether it's iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, TuneIn, or RSS, you can find links to everything on the official website, www.therobburgessshow.com. You can also find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. Back to today's show. Bryn Greenwood is a fourth-generation Kansan, one of seven sisters, and the daughter of a mostly reformed drug dealer. She earned an MA in creative writing and continues to work in academia as an administrator. Her novel, All the Ugly and Wonderful Things, is coming from St. Martin's Press in August. She is also the author of the small press novels, Last Will, and Lie, Lay, Lane. Her stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Battered Suitcase, Kansas Quarterly, and Chiron Review. She lives in Lawrence, Kansas, where she is married to an extensive home remodeling project and is raising a small herd of boxers and hairless cats. I first became aware of Bryn on November 29, 2015, when she tweeted the following. I worked at a Planned Parenthood clinic in Kansas for three years. My coworkers and I were subjected to the following acts of terrorism. Gasoline was poured under our back door and ignited four times, twice while the clinic was occupied, causing patients to be evacuated. Butyric acid, used as a stink bomb, was poured under our doors and into ventilation systems so many times I lost count. Clinic evacuated. Two cherry bombs were left on our doorstep after hours, causing damage and clinic closure. Imagine what it's like going to work after that. We received hundreds of phone calls threatening to torch our clinic and kill the murdering horrors who worked there. Three times someone drove by at night and shot out our windows. Picketers stood on the sidewalk and harassed employees as we swept up broken glass. Our clinic didn't perform abortions. We did well women exams, pregnancy tests, dispensed birth control, and treated STIs. Our clinic offered free and low-cost services in a low-income neighborhood, but every day the pro-life movement tried to frighten us. The goal was to make us afraid to come to work, to make us quit, to make us close the clinic. That's terrorism. That's how terrorism works. Anyone who approves of harassing clinics is giving support to terrorism. Stand with Planned Parenthood. At the same time, I volunteered at Dr. George Tiller's abortion clinic. In 1993, he was shot by a pro-lifer. He came to work the next day. Dr. Tiller kept coming back to work after he was shot because he was a caring man who knew how important his work was. 
In 2009, Dr. Tiller was murdered in his own church, again by a pro-lifer. The goal was to scare the other doctors who perform abortions. Abortions are still provided in Dr. Tiller's old clinic, because that's how you respond to terrorism. We can't let them win. I then stumbled across Bryn's January 14th essay for the New York Times titled, Why I Always Wanted to Be a Secretary, which you should definitely read. You can find Bryn on her website at www.brengreenwood.com. That's B-R-Y-N-G-R-E-E-N-W-O-O-D.com. And now on to the show. Hello. Hey, Bryn, it's Rob. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. I'm finally home. Thank you for being uh, so patient. I appreciate it. Well, you know, it gives me an excuse to sit up a little late and do some writing. Oh, that's totally... Well, I want that's something I want to ask you about. <laughs> so, But uh, right. before we uh, get into any of that, uh, just go ahead and tell people whatever you want them to know about you. <laughs> that seems like a trick question. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess primarily, uh, I'm Bryn Greenwood. Uh, my new novel, All the Ugly Monster Things, is coming out in August, which is frighteningly close. And if you hear barking in the background, that's my dog. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, I uh, first became aware of you uh, after that whole Planned Parenthood uh, tweet uh, situation where you uh, told uh, about your experiences uh, working there. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll have already read those at the top of the show, so I won't repeat them back to you now. But um, did you expect such a huge response uh, from those tweets? I really didn't just because I had I had tweeted before about, you know, different things about working for Planned Parenthood. But, you know, on that particular day, obviously, everybody was really thinking about it because of the attack in Colorado Springs. But uh, then after I saw those tweets uh, about Planned Parenthood, I then uh, w- stumbled upon your piece in the New York Times, uh, which if people haven't read, they really should. Uh, it was why I always wanted to be a secretary was the name of it. Uh, I thought it was great. It was uh, it was very well written, and uh, you had a pretty uh, pretty grabby opening there with the nuclear reactor. I was I was uh, I was pulled in right away. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, who's not a sucker for a nuclear reactor? <laughs> exactly. It puts a, paint, a real picture in your head. You know, I think when you hear that. Um, but uh, what's been the response to that? Um, well, you know, I saw, uh, I, I don't know how much you're familiar with Goodreads. Or, do you know what Goodreads is? Mm-hmm. Well, it's very funny because, like, you can you can watch certain things correlate with, like, how many ad, you know, how many people add your book to their to-read list. That's the number one thing that uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the, the main response that I noticed from the New York Times piece was that I had a huge bump in the number of people who added any of my books to their reading list. Oh, cool. Um, I did get some hate mail, which I think is an important lesson because, essentially, you can write an essay about being a secretary and people will still send you hate mail. But they will send you hate mail about anything. What? What kind of hate mail did you get from that? <laughs> oh, mostly what I got were people who wanted to tell me that if I thought secretaries didn't get paid enough or respected enough that I should get a real college degree and a real, I assume, a manly college degree and job. Stuff like that. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I, I get I get hate mail all the time. Uh, just <laughs> right. It's pretty most, standard. <laughs> yeah. Don't put your opinion or whatever out there. But it always surprises me what what gets that kind of response because I'll write something and I'm like, oh, I'm going to clear my inbox for this one. I'm going to get the hate mail, and then nobody will say anything. And then I'll tweet or I'll write a column or a story about something that I'm like, oh, and then they're like, bah. it's like really this is the one. <laughs> like, it's the one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you uh, you talked a little bit about your uh, your growing up in Kansas. There, uh, I've never been to Kansas, and I only uh, know it from you know movies and whatnot. I've, I've driven through Nebraska twice, both on the to and wow. from California, and that was yeah. <laughs> you should have come the southern route on the way back. I know. Well, tell me about it. It was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but tell us about what what is Kansas like for us? Uh, well, what I often tell people is that Kansas is. About as flat as you imagine, but it's it's actually quite a bit more charming if you can overlook our political situation. Because <laughs> um, it it actually I love Kansas. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's people are for the most part 
really nice people and mm-hmm. um you know there's just enough crazy weather to keep things interesting and i actually like the flatlands i uh, i grew up out in the southwest portion mm-hmm. of kansas where literally there are places out there that are so flat that you can see the curvature of the earth i'm That's... not exaggerating wow it's flat yeah um, and for me i find that I, that feels safer to me where, you know, you can see everything around you. And so when I you live in cities or in places where they're heavily wooded, I just always really feel like it's really pent up. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's interesting. You say that about the landscape because I grew up in Southern Indiana, which is getting into like, you know, Kentucky hill country almost, uh, in the right. geogra- geographic range. And, you know, uh, I was just thinking about this today cause we had a huge storm on the way home, uh, that was just uh, hail and just everything, uh, but it, it occurs to me when I was growing up, it didn't that didn't happen quite as much because there wasn't the the flatness of the earth to you know it, it, there's nothing to break it up you know what I mean yeah uh, and then I lived in Northern California for a time and that's we lived between two mountains in this valley um, so it was like the the crowd the cloud formations were were totally different and we never got these like sweeping uh, winds through so yeah and you see a Amazing yeah. clouds here. Uh, I feel like compared to other places, um, it's uh, the sunsets and sunrises are spectacular um, when there's nothing yeah. obstructing. Well, you know what I mean? That's one of the big sales pitches for the flatlands. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Um, so anyway, that's yeah, that's definitely a part of, of what I've read of your writing. Um, so uh, in your bio, you sent me uh, this line jumped out at me. It said you were the daughter of a mostly reformed drug dealer. Uh, that, right. that that kind of that kind of uh, my mom Mind made a, a highlighter motion over that little phrase in there, and I was like, hmm. So, would you mind expanding on that? Well, you know, it's one of those bio lines that, that had I my druthers, it would not be in there, hmm. but since my forthcoming novel is about a little girl whose father's a drug dealer, oh, you know, publicity at St. Martin's Press felt that it was important, I guess, on some level for me to establish hmm. my bona fides regarding drug dealers. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, so yeah. The, no, the fact is though that uh, for a goodly portion of the '80s, my father ran one of the largest um, meth production and distribution rings in the Midwest. So. Oh. Okay. <laughs> right. You're like so. Yeah. There's that. But but I assume since you put this in your bio, you're okay with people knowing about that about um, you. I, I've gotten over it. You know, I spent a, a pretty good portion of my life not telling people that and being sort of, you know, ashamed. I, I was 14 when he was arrested and went to prison, and it was in the papers, and it was, it was very sort of, you know, it was a humiliating thing that you really would rather forget about. But at my age now, I'm like, oh, who even cares? Whatever. <laughs> Well, uh, yes, I'm, these yeah. are my people. I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, exactly. Am I proud of him? No. Do, do, do I think it was terrible? Not really. Mm. That's interesting. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I can see why you would be reticent to tell people that. Um, you know, I, I would. I would definitely think twice. But I mean, it does seem to relate to what you're saying about your your writing, and that is, you know, I wanted to get to that too. Um, but if, let's go back to when you were growing up uh, in Kansas. What what authors were you reading growing up? Oh, um, well, I would say that my my initial obsessions uh, were Ursula Le Guin. Mm. Um, and especially the Earth Sea trilogy, or it was at, a, at the time it was a trilogy. Is uh, I used to cycle through those books oh, a couple times a year. Mm. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, I, I went through the phase that I think everybody went through when they were my age in that time is reading Stephen King. You know, oh just God. stay up That's... late, just scare the crap out of yourself. I ran a Stephen King fan club. Oh, well, I, I, I imagine that somebody, that everybody, you know, has some, one of those connections because he's so huge. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that was for sure. What's your favorite Stephen King? Oh, you know, okay, it, it depends. When I'm homesick, and I mean like really sick, not like the, uh, I just kind of stuffy headed and you're calling out to work because you don't really want to go in. But like when you're honestly sick, my favorite book to read, can you guess? Mm. That's a tough one, man. I don't know. Um, the stand. That was what I was going to say. It's my favorite, too. 
Oh my God! Well, guess what, folks? I'm sorry. You can stop. You can stop expecting anything else because we're going to talk about the stand for a while. Okay. Um, all right. I love the stand. I read it when I was in junior high. Um, it, it blew my mind. I, I got the expanded edition too. I didn't get the original. Oh, you went for the director's cut, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I had to go for the source. Once I knew there was that much out there that it was on the other one, I was like, why? Why even bother? Um, so I read. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm still reading my original paperback. Wow. From when I was like. 10, mm. so I'm still reading the old version, but it's still, when I'm home sick, mm. I'll knock it out in about two days, you know, lie on the wow. couch. So you're, a, fa- you're a fast reader. It's, well, but it's also a book I've read probably 20 that's times. That's true, that's every, true. Every winter when I get the flu or a cold or something, like, that's my go-to book, because I'm like, yes, people mm. getting sick and dying of a terrible place. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> Go through the Holland Tunnel. Um, right. Yeah. No, that's crazy that you say that. That was my favorite, too. I would say, though, that it holds the, the, the problem is that's most that's true when I'm sick. But my other big favorite is The Dead Zone. The Dead Zone. I don't think I read The Dead Zone. Uh, yeah, and you can't watch the movie. Like, don't even don't even go down that road. Don't watch the movie. Mm. But the book is great. It's about a political candidate, right? Primarily, it's about a guy who's go is in an accident is in a coma and mm. comes out of the coma as a psychic mm. <laughs> that's really what it's about i see the, the political stuff comes in later oh so. okay. interesting well back to the stand though my favorite chapter in the stand is this one-off chapter where he has these little vignettes about these people that you never see before or after yeah. that somehow survive the plague but then they die and really like bizarre and unexpected ways um that was that would that that was another one of those little things about the stand that blew my mind um well wow, how did you feel about the ending of that book um with the yeah, god I'm thing not, I, i'm are you okay with that well as an atheist i i pretty much have to approach any book that has any kind of religious tone to it mm-hmm. just sort of mythologically i'm mm-hmm. like okay well with with in the construct of this book, I accept this to be true. Mm-hmm. Like I, I tend to just, I'll, I'll buy into whatever you know the world view is, mm-hmm. and so for me, I'm okay with it. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I guess I was just primed to experience that as a more factually based book, based on the, kind of the content of most and of the book. It was, it was a switcheroo, but then you have there, there are elements running all along, like the fact that. Um, that there are certain characters that are presented from the very beginning as evil. Mm. Like, and evil is not a scientific concept. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, they're, you know, they're presenting this whole notion of good and evil. Right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, that kind of took me out of it a little bit, uh, and especially when I saw the TV miniseries. Uh, for... uh, see, and I, I'll confess, I've not seen, I haven't seen any of the production efforts. That's that's all right. For it either, yeah. it's just the book that I've focused on. Good. That's a, keep it there. <laughs> don't need to. <laughs> don't need to stray. So head for, head for open waters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although there is a um, uh, new version. Uh, oh no no no! I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the Dark Tower. Uh, uh, there's going to be a filmed version of the Dark Tower uh, with uh, Matthew McConaughey as Randall Flagg and. Um, and Idris Elba, the yeah, most beautiful man on earth. Exactly. <laughs> that was another switcheroo. Speaking of switcheroos, yeah. see that one coming. Um, but that totally makes sense to me, and that's good casting, I think. But anyway, yeah. So that's really cool that you like Stephen King. I, I obviously do too. But oh. um, yeah. I still haven't read it. <laughs> see, now that's the kind of book that I think of when I think of myself. You know, as a teenager. Staying awake way too late and just scaring the crap out of myself. In fact, when I walk my dog, we walk by a storm drain, and every night when she stops to sniff at it, I say, are there any clowns down there? Oh, my God. See, I was scared of clowns before I <laughs> right? knew it's that terrifying. story. And now it's that, like, nope. After the book, you're just like, you, it just gives you the willies. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, who else? What other authors? Oh, um... Wow. I mean, it kind of depends because my my sort of reading habits are really split. Mm. And you know, I got I, I got two college degrees in English and read a ton of literature, and I still love that. But on the other hand, I really you know 
I don't know. Uh, when I was younger, I was obsessed with Louis L'Amour books. I don't know. Mm, interesting. Uh, as an adult, I still love Margaret Atwood. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Toni Morrison. Mm. Um, and, of course, uh, my my all-time champ, the, the author whose books I have in enormous numbers, Anthony Trollope. Mm. The 19th century British author. You know, he wrote 47 books, so wow. it's a lot. It's a nice substantial over of stuff to read. Yeah, that'll keep And lots of, uh, lots of really cool social commentary as well. Wow. Well, I feel very unread, so. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, and that's just it. Is everybody has their, their areas of specialty. Yeah. Oh sure. Well, I talked to my uh, my uh, friend of a friend, uh, Melanie Sime. She was on one of my previous podcasts, and she mm-hmm. has uh, books blog called "So I Follow Julian." You should check out. Uh, but right. she, uh, yeah, she, you know, was talking about uh, what was it? Oh, uh, Bretty Stanellis. We talked about for a long time because that the uh-huh. name of her blog is from a Bretty Stanellis book. Um, Chuck Palnick. Uh, we we talked about his collected works. Um, who else? Did we talk about um but yeah no like you said there's people there's people that you have expertise in and then just flying right over your head with what you were saying about that person so i uh i need to what book would you recommend to start with with that author anthony trollope if you're gonna read any of them start with um the way we live now Mm. and you can actually even start with the bbc mini series which was wonderful Mm. It's got uh, David Suchet playing sort of the the arch villain of the piece. Hmm. Um, but it's uh, that book is is amazing, and it still rings true. It's it's pretty much it's about scoundrels and um, wealthy young men, or young men who would like to be wealthy, and bank cons, and terrible love affairs, and. It, it basically all the same stuff we've got going on today. People in debt, mm. corrupt bankers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm excited to check that out. Um, do you have any guilty pleasures when it comes to books? Or do you believe in guilty pleasures when it comes I to books? I actually, I can't think of anything I'd be ashamed to admit that I read. And that includes, what have I got here on my bookcase that I just recently read that, that, uh, would probably not be, you know. Oh, look, I've got uh, Mr. Darcy Vampire. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, so, vampire with a Y. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> so, no, I, I guess I guess if I, if I were going to be, um, you know, embarrassed about it, I probably just wouldn't even pick it up and and try it. <laughs> <laughs> So you're just reading whatever hits you, and you don't care who knows it. Yeah, and you know, the nice thing is, my sister um, is zombie-obsessed, mm-hmm. and has been for a decade. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she, my guess would be the foremost expert on zombie books, mm. and she's also, you know, branched out into, uh, oh, like, post-apocalyptic stuff, and... Mm. All of that stuff. So, so no. I mean, I I figure everybody has to have that thing that just really hooks them, and whatever mm-hmm. that is, that's awesome. Well, that's yeah, that's a very positive way of looking at it. <laughs> um, my Which wife, is, of course, not to say that there aren't things I don't like, but you right. know, I usually just avoid them. <laughs> sure, but you but you like what you like. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, okay, cool. Um, so, how do you avoid sounding like? your influences or people that you like to read when you're writing, do you think? I don't have a clue. Mm. Now, on the upside, uh, I've been writing seriously for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I really had a pretty good chance to develop my own voice Mm -hmm. for for what I write. And the other hand is I, I often don't read anything related to what I'm working on. Yeah, that's important, I think, because you don't want to accidentally, like, you know, subconsciously yeah. lift something, even if you don't mean to. Well, you don't even want to absorb it very much. So, right. yeah, whenever I'm, whatever I'm working on, more than likely I will be reading something completely different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And especially it's like if you're writing about something that's like super everyone's talking about it, 
it's hard yeah. to have an original take on it. And you can easily get discouraged if you realize that you're the 15th millionth person to say whatever you're saying. <laughs> but, you know, you still got to do it anyway because no one's here, heard you say it, you know, I guess. It's the, well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> for me, though, I think that's the nice thing about fiction is that it percolates for so long uh, that uh, that eventually, you know, it'll, it'll be... It'll be your own personal thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's partially why I was interested in talking to you because I'm I'm kind of trying to – I've always wanted to, but I, I really do want to finally make some kind of headway into writing fiction. And I'm just – I don't know where to start and where to begin, and I feel like I'm, I'm so in the mindset of writing, you know, nonfiction – that yeah. it's it's hard to put myself in the the headspace where I would where I'm going to do that because you you have to create the world in fiction, uh, yeah. nonfiction. It's kind of lazy if you ask me. And I'm I, I pride myself. I think I'm pretty good at writing nonfiction, but you know, but it is all there. You know, you just got to grab it. Right. And you fit, you're creating the whole everything, the the rules, the universe, the physics, the you know, from top to bottom, it's all you. You have to take responsibility for everything in the frame, and I think that's a little bit, I don't know, it's a little bit jarring or intimidating for somebody who doesn't, you know, usually well, do that. Well, and, and, and so much of it, though, well, you know, like contemporary fiction, obviously, you know, the where I'm writing with with all the ugly and wonderful things, that's actually, you know, 1970s Kansas. You know, it was real. I did, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I could write a lot of truthful things, but yeah, when you get into fantasy and sci-fi and things like that, and and like magical realism, yeah, you really are building from scratch. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, writing, uh, like what time of day, like like late at night sometimes. But <laughs> what is your pro- writing process like usually, or what do you like it to be? I um, uh, I'm terrible. Um, I know lots of people say things like, oh, you have to write every day. You don't. <laughs> mm. It helps because, you know, you accumulate a lot of words if you're writing every day. Um, but I am really kind of chaotic. I don't know. Some days I'll, if, I, if I'm really in a good place where I know exactly what the story is doing, I know what happens next, I know all the things, I'll write every day and I'll write for, you know, four or five hours. Mm. And then other times I'll go months and months and not write anything. Wow. Except, you know, maybe a blog post. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I'm not even very reliable about right. that. Um, so, so my process is pretty chaotic. Hmm. And I don't have a set time of day. I'm not a morning person. Hmm. Um, but I have a job that requires me to get up in the morning. Right. A lot of times I come home from work and sit on the couch because the dogs won't let me sit anywhere else. Mm-hmm. You know, if you go in the office, you've abandoned them and it's very sad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sit on the couch and I have a cute little laptop desk and I write and usually I can produce about a thousand words in two hours. Yeah. That seems terrible. And then it's time to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's definitely just like making time for it, but that's interesting that you say that you don't do it every day. It's actually kind of not what I expected you to say. <laughs> well, and that's, I always feel weird because I know that the, I know that the narrative for productive authors is supposed to be, you know, butt in chair. That's, you know, everybody mm-hmm. uses that little acronym. Um, I know it's supposed to be this thing where you're like Hemingway and you get up at 6 a.m. every day and write for two hours, but shit, I guess I'm not Hemingway. <laughs> um, yeah, true. So, I mean, I don't know. Um, mm. I'll give you an example, and this is and this is actually maybe just proof that that I have a problem mm-hmm. and everybody else is doing okay. But when I wrote all the ugly and wonderful things, I was literally writing for four or five hours every single night for nearly a month. Mm. And that was on top of my day job. And that was on top of doing home remodeling. Mm. Um, and I was literally up until 2 AM every night writing because I was so compelled. It, it was a compulsion. I was like, I have to get the story out. And everything was there, and it just all, mm. you know, came out. <laughs> That's got to be a good feeling, though. I mean. It, well, it's nice. I mean, a lot of people are like, wow, you're so lucky. And then I'm like, yes, but then, you know, I spent two years revising. 
<laughs> wow. Okay. So, you know, I know people who spend two years writing and a month revising. I guess I'm the reverse. Hmm. It is nice, though, because you get a first draft down really quickly and you can really, you know. Yeah, I mean, you have to have something on the, you know, page to, to you know, tear apart or whatever. So. And, and that's really, you know, that's really the reality. If you want to get into writing fiction, you just have to bang your head against the wall something. and You really, you just it. have yeah. to produce words. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can do that. <laughs> I know a few. Um, so, uh, so this is this is another thing that I really wanted to talk to you about. Um, I'm I'm a man, obviously, but I have had a compul not a compulsion. It just keeps coming up that every time I think about writing fiction. I keep wanting to do it from a female character's point of view. And I think it has to do with this thing I once heard that most women read, read books. Like, or, no, I'm sorry. Most people that read books are women, rather. Um, yeah, women certainly uh, are, are far more represented in people who purchase and read fiction than yeah. men. Yeah, but but um, but ironically, but, yeah. mm-hmm. um, that isn't that. So far, that doesn't really parlay into lots more books about women. No, no, no. That's what I was getting to. And and women are asked all the time to do the very thing that I am trying, struggling so hard with, is that they are asked by you know the the book to put themselves in the perspective of the male character because it's the male protagonist. That's a very common thing. Um, so women do this all the time. I feel like, and and I I'm just having such a hard time of of getting doing the opposite. But what what advice would you have for somebody like me who's who's writing for? And I'm sure you've written male characters, obviously too. So you've you've had experience with this. But what would you recommend to me as a man writing for a woman that I should be aware of? Well, you know, I, I think the, one of the things to think about here is it's not just that women are used to casting themselves um, in the roles of men. It's that, for instance, like, uh, you know, ethnic minorities, um, racial minorities, mm. you know, <laughs> are almost constantly asked to sympathize with and identify with, um, you know, characters who are essentially homogenized American white people. You know, you go to the movies and... 99% of them, the main characters are white. Right. And so, you know, black people in America, for instance, are especially called upon to be able to identify with white people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so part of the process is just to go to the place where you're like, okay, <laughs> I have to produce a, a sensation in which I'm probably going to be uncomfortable because I'm going to be somebody else. And mm-hmm. I, I swear to you, I really do. I start out sort of having conversations with characters in my head where I'm just talking to them, like, how did you end it? What, what happened here? You know, but at a certain point, almost I have to start acting it out and I'll be walking around, Mm. you know, thinking, okay, I'm this character. What do I do when this happens? What do I do Mm. when this happens? How do I feel about this experience? That's very Robert De Niro of you. <laughs> it's uh, it's called. Is it called method acting? Yes, is that what it is? indeed. Okay, so I I am a method writer, and I oh and wow, I, okay. Well, I mean, I feel weird saying that, but it is so true. Wow. I okay, like um, the book that I wrote before all the ugly and wonderful things, um, which my former agent was unable to sell. And speaking of, this is a weird, you know, the world wraps up back around. Mm. Uh, my former agent uh, is from Kokomo, Indiana. Yeah, I remember you said that to me when we first uh, talked. Yeah, yeah that's so, that's amazing. Uh, but uh, he, so unfortunately, he was unable to sell it uh, ah. because the market wasn't right or, you know, maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't my time. Uh, but it's about a black man from the Oklahoma Panhandle who's on death row. Mm. <laughs> and he's, he's very much, you know, of my, you know, geographic culture. Hmm. Somebody who was born and raised in the Oklahoma Panhandle, and, you know, he's raised by a foster family who was white, and and he's the guy that I know, you know, like not in the literal sense, but, in, like, he walks, he talks, he acts, he thinks about the world a very great deal like the guys I grew up around, except for the fact that because he's a black man, he's always been on the outside. He's mm-hmm. always been, you know, set aside. Mm-hmm. And and toward the end of working on that book, I was literally sort of walking around the world thinking like him. Mm-hmm. Like every interaction I had with people, I was like, yes, but 
you know, what would he do in my situation? To the degree that I found myself sort of like checking out waitresses' cleavage. And stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like just to hypothesize, like, okay, but like if I were him and I were here, what would I be doing and saying? Hmm. I don't know if that's even remotely helpful. No, no, that's that's an interesting way of thinking of it. I never even considered doing that. <laughs> um, you know, and a lot of it, too, is reading, you know, books about, you know, the narrative angle you want to take on something. You know, you, if you want to write about, you know, uh, a housewife from Michigan, well, figure out if you can read some stuff by housewives from Michigan or if you can meet a housewife from Michigan yeah. or uh, – you know. No, that that totally makes sense. That's good advice. And I, I actually spent a lot of time while I was working on the book chatting with people on a couple of different um, prison forums. Hmm. Wow. Just because I was like, okay, I really, you know, I know I had some personal experiences related to when my father was in prison. Oh, wow. Um, but, uh, you know, what is it like now? What's it like, you know, for not just for the family left on the outside, what's it like for the inmate? You mm-hmm. Know? Wow. Well, that must have been an intense experience uh, for being that young, uh, encountering that. I, I would never, you know, watching the Scared Straight VHS is probably the closest I got to to that. Well, and the thing is, though, and this is what I always, this is one of the reasons that uh, I I think I feel sort of weirdly obligated when I tell stories about the Midwest and about other stuff like that. Is I'm like, the world is filled with people whose parents were in prison when they were kids. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like there are just so many things that we don't talk about or that we don't write about or, mm-hmm. you know. Well, especially with the, you know, drug war and, and things like that, you know, we, we lock up so many people, you know, more people than anyone, turns out. Yeah. So, yeah, that happens to a lot of people, for sure. Um, now, another thing I want to know, and maybe you already answered this with your thing about going method and all that, um, <laughs> how do you write natural-seeming dialogue? Because I think that's one thing that once when I write fiction, uh I, I start writing dialogue, and I just I'm just like, oh, I hate everything I'm writing right now. It doesn't sound good. This is not how people talk. And then I think maybe I should put a recorder in my pocket and walk around all day and listen to how people talk. And I'm okay. like, that's psychotic. Don't do that. <laughs> there, that does sort of there's a certain sort of element of desperation to that. Right. Um, I have a theory though. Mm-hmm. And I, I developed this. I took a bunch of playwriting classes when I was in college too, because uh, I had this great professor, uh, Dr. Norman Fetter, who, mm-hmm. who was really wonderful. And um, I developed this theory that the trick is not to write realistic dialogue. Hmm. The trick is to write dialogue, which creates a facade of verisimilitude. It seems realistic without actually being realistic. Hmm. And I think you get there. I imagine this in my brain when I'm when I'm chopping apart dialogue because I always I massively overwrite everything. If that certainly includes dialogue, if I if I end up with a page of dialogue, it's because I started with like five pages of dialogue hmm. because people say such fucking <laughs> mundane, you know. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, right. And, and you don't need that. No. And so what you think of it like an, an enzymatic action. Like you want to take your five pages of dialogue and like apply an enzyme that's actually going to like partially digest your dialogue. Mm. So that like all of the sort of mundane stuff is going to break down and you're going to wash it out in the rinse cycle. Um, and you're going to end up with the more, you know, like elemental parts of dialogue, hmm. like stuff that will, stuff that's more, I hate to say probative, because <laughs> that sounds quite <laughs> too legal, but I'm saying it's the stuff that, uh, that's, that's more essential to the plot, mm-hmm. because the dialogue has to serve plot. If it's mm-hmm. just, people sometimes, I read books and I get freaked out because I'm like, this person has written this dialogue. As filler. This is filler. Yeah. You know, oh, hi, Mary. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. How's Bob? Well, I mean, yeah, that's realistic. That's the stupid shit we say. Mm-hmm. But 
that's not what you want to end up with. You want to end up with dialogue that's going to move your plot. You want dialogue that's got tension in it. You've got, there's got to be some element of conflict. Hmm. And I'm not just saying that because that's how all the dialogue in my marriage was. <laughs> I'm saying they're really, you have to have some sort of push and pull going on. Hmm. So well, it's that, not really realistic. Yeah, it's not. It's all, all con- it's all constructed. I mean, it's yeah. boring stuff. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so uh, I, I'll just add, start asking you this since you brought it up. How much of your own life do you feel comfortable putting into fiction? Because that's another thing, you know. The, 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 the things that make you want to write and the things that make you want to write fiction are things that are significant to you and things that happen in your personal life. But unless your entire family and friends are dead or don't speak to you anymore, they have a possibility. You can make happen, I've, I've heard. What's that? You can make that happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> family don't speak to you. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, as long as they're alive and they can read this thing you wrote, you can say it's fiction, but... And, then, and what if they see themselves in what you wrote? See, and that is part of the whole percolation thing as well. Mm-hmm. Is If something sits long enough, you're going to be able to see. Because the, the problem that happens to some people mm-hmm. is they take their personal experiences and they fictionalize them. Mm-hmm. But they do it when things are... They do it in such a way that they're retaining too much of the source material. Mm. What you really want to retain is almost the experiential element mm-hmm. of the source material, not the literal source material, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, yes, um, you know, my father was a drug dealer when I was a kid, and yes, when I was way too young, I had several very romantic relationships with men who were far too old for me. Um, two traits that I share with the main character of all the ugly and wonderful things, but she's not me. Mm-hmm. There, are some, there are some places where... We rub elbows, mm-hmm. but she's not me, and neither is anybody else in the book a direct correlation to anybody in my life. They may be influenced by people I knew, and there may be events in the book that remind me experientially of things that happened to me, but none of it's, you know, a direct translation. But was that an intentional choice, or did it just end up yeah. that way? But it was an easy intentional choice because I was sort of far enough removed from it and I that I could identify places where I was being too, you know, I had I had too direct correlation. And I could go, okay, that really does seem too similar to something that did happen or this person really does seem too similar to someone who existed. Hmm. And then you just kind of pick them apart and figure out what you need to change. Hmm. So that was all. That, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that makes sense, though. I mean, you have to be intentional about that thing, um, especially when you know, like, like, like I said, if you want to maintain any kind of relationship with certain people after this comes out. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you don't want to do anything cruel either, and this sure. is why, you know, the the little girl in this book, her father is really kind of a terrible person, mm-hmm. um, but he also isn't anything like my father. Mm-hmm. I mean. <laughs> So it's sort of like, well, you know, I've known plenty of terrible people, which I can borrow to produce this character, but it's not my father. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, you know, going out, kind of back to your using your own life and in, infection, in, in do you currently or did you, I'm sure at some point you've kept a diary or journal, right? Um, well, I, I did when I was younger, yeah. You don't, fact, any, do you don't as, not anymore? As far as I know, the FBI maybe has it, or maybe... <laughs> really? The, y- yes. Um, I used to write diaries, and I used to... I carried them with me. Mm. You know, I was the kind of kid that, you know, if I was going to go to my father's house for the summer, mm-hmm. I took all my diaries. Mm. And when he was arrested, it was this huge, elaborate raid performed by the FBI and the BATF and the DEA and and the U.S. Marshals and a bunch of other people. You know, they came in with helicopters and SWAT teams and stuff like that and arrested everybody. Uh, we never got back any of our belongings. They kept everything? Why did they keep yeah, the journals? We, we, we never got any of our luggage back or what? any of our possessions wow. back. None of it. 
Could you get it back now? Or that it's all uh, no. <laughs> it's I, been I don't even know where I would start <laughs> to get it back. I don't. I mean, I assume I'd have to start with like a Freedom of Information Act or something right. to find out. Um, but a lot of stuff after that raid huh. went missing. Like a lot of valuable stuff went missing as wow. well. Wow. So. Wow. Um, but including, you know, thirteen-year-old me's deepest, darkest secrets. <laughs> so I don't really anymore. I I journal, but it's strictly fiction stuff mm. that I journal about. Well, I have to imagine that if you ever were able to find that, that would be pretty interesting <laughs> to read, right? Or would you? could you bear to read it, though, now? Would you even oh, want to read no, that? Oh, no, it would be epic. I would have to read it. It would It would be epic. Mm. You know, because that, that encompasses, you know, all of my first forays into adulthood. <laughs> right. But are you okay? This is another thing about keeping a journal or diary. Are you okay with other people having possibility of reading it, you know? Um, well, you know, after all, I, I sort of feel like fiction writing is, I don't know, it's like the process of, you know, the, the nightmare about you go to school naked, Mm -hmm. writing books and selling them is pretty much the professional equivalent thereof. Mm. Okay. (laughs) So, so no, I mean, I, I feel like, I guess, no, the thought of people reading it wouldn't be too terrifying to me. (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess this goes back to the guilty pleasures thing. You just, I, I apparently feel more shame about what I've written than, or what I read than other people. Um, but, um, no, I, I go back and I read stuff even from a few years ago. I'm like, who is this person? Why? Oh, Why? Well, don't, don't think I don't have that. Cause I actually, you know, like I, I journal now pretty strictly fictionally and I'll go back and read through stuff and I'll be cringing like, Oh God, really? I, what direct, you know, God, that's crap. <laughs> and occasionally I'll find something that I'll be like, did somebody steal my journal and write in it? Because I don't remember writing this. It's just, it's, it's like I've had some sort of a split with reality and wrote something totally not like me. Right. Right. Have you ever done the exercise where you just close your eyes and type for a while? <laughs> Man, you don't want to read that. Like, that's, there's some stuff in there you shouldn't know. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm like that sometimes on Friday at work. That's true. I uh, guess I guess if you type enough, it can turn into that. <laughs> but, um, but that's, yeah, that's interesting. But, yeah, no, I've always wanted to keep a diary or a journal. I think it would be especially useful um, for, like, recalling details that you would have otherwise forgot or think you're going to remember and then don't. Um, and I think that's important for, you know, to, to create fiction. I feel like you need to be very detail-oriented. And I feel like if you're writing about a specific time and place in your own life or that's inspired by your own life, that kind of stuff can be very, you know, the source materials from the time is always very valuable, yeah. I think. so. Um, but that would, yeah. Well, let me know if you ever get those back. I want to hear <laughs> what you find. I mean, I don't know how much chance of that it happened, but that's an amazing I story. Didn't know. But, so, FBI, if you're listening, you know, give her back the stuff, man. I hope you're not. I got tired of that. <laughs> Well, you know, they're all listening to us now, but, um, (laughs) so uh, do you have a worst habit as a writer? I don't know. Like, what do you mean? Like, is there something that you do that you find yourself and it's like, why do I keep doing that? Like, it's like, like a tick or something like, you know, something about your writing that you just do automatically. Like, oh, I I thought the question was of a different nature, which I'll explain, but, uh, Um, I, I think everybody has things where they're like, you have those lazy words that you just have to go and do a fine replace when you finish your first draft and get rid of like every instance of just only kind of sort of, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's so annoying. <laughs> um, but the reality is, I don't know, in terms of just of producing words i i originally interpreted your question where my mind went automatically was are there plot temptations or you know themes well yeah that's actually a more interesting question so yeah answer that question <laughs> well i think everybody has that like where you have like you start a, you start a story and you're writing and you're writing and you're writing and you're writing and then you're like shit this is just like that other story i wrote Right. <laughs> or you just keep finding the same, okay, like, <laughs> I cannot even tell you the number of stories in which sort of like one of the important side characters is somebody's aunt or uncle. Hmm. Like, why? I, 
Does that correlate to well, anything in your life, though? Well, that's just it. I mean, I had a lot of aunts and uncles. They're almost all dead now. Mm. Um, but uh, I don't remember having, like, any obsession with any of them. Mm. So I don't, I, it's very weird, and I find my, I get annoyed. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously something your subconscious is like still like playing with the idea or whatever, or it wouldn't right? keep coming up. So, uh, well, and this is why, uh, in, in many ways, uh, the book that I've got coming out is sort of like, a, I, I hope an end of an era for me, um, mm-hmm. in that I hope I have finally written the definitive thing that I want to write about, um, you know, serious age different relationships because <laughs> I, I can't, I can't help but, you know, see the number of times I've start, I worked on a project and that sort of theme has come up and I've been like, ah, that's annoying with that. Um, and so in this one I was like, yeah, screw it. Okay. I've got an obsession with that. Here it is. Hmm. <laughs> Do you mind talking about that at all or is that um, too personal? No. Um, you know, I, I have, I've had to talk about it for publicity already for the book. Okay. Um, it's again, it's like my bona fides. Um, yeah. you know, it could be okay. because in the book, um, the two main characters, um, who are eventually romantically involved, uh, have about a 13 year age difference. Mm-hmm. And when they meet, she is eight and he's 21. Um, and it's, I won't disagree with the reviewer who called it discomforting, but okay. Um, and part of my bona fides is that when I was quite young, I had a whole series of romantic affairs with really much older men. When I was uh, 13, my boyfriend was 28. When I was 15, I had a boyfriend who was 25. When I was 16, I got a little closer in and he was only 22. Um <laughs> So, so yeah, I had a whole series of relationships with guys who were way too old for me. Hmm. And in this day and age, I think there would mm-hmm. there would be a lot, um, yeah, a lot more trouble made about it. But you know, in small town Kansas in the eighties, the sheriff was sort of like, uh, whatever. Well, that's that's funny you say that because um, I have a coworker who does this series called uh, Half a Century and Happy, and um, she interviews people that have been married for fifty oh, years or more. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's a cool. It, it's a, I I think she should turn it into a book. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's like a not a not insignificant amount of these stories begin with <laughs> these kind of age of differences you're talking about. It, well, and you know, like uh, one set of my grandparents, yeah, he was uh, uh-huh. when they married. I believe she was fifteen and he was twenty-eight. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so and uh, but I think the fact that um, <laughs> that it's lasted this long, uh, you know, that almost proves it's like, well, you know, it worked out, I guess. So right, <laughs> people are just and willing it, to overlook that kind of thing at this point. <laughs> well, and it's one of those things where. You know, there are obviously two sides to every coin. Mm-hmm. And so for every guy you have that, that can be trusted with an underage girl and who's going to behave respectfully, right. there are, I don't know how many dozen skeevy assholes who are trying to coerce teenage girls into having sex. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's hard to sort them. It's You can see why even relatively decent people can end up in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I saw a lot of it when I worked for Planned Parenthood. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I did uh, I did sexuality education, and I went out to high schools, and I went out to um, different groups that were sponsored by the social services and, like, DECA and uh, all of that stuff. And so I met a lot of teenage girls. Mm. And I met a lot of teenage girls with much older boyfriends. And mm. I met teenage girls who were pregnant by their much older boyfriend. Mm. And, um, you know, a lot of people that I didn't have any sort of uh, professional connection with, that just because I had been to their school, they, you know, talked to me about it. And, and yeah, I saw cases where I was like, okay, seriously, this guy is, is using you. This guy can't be trusted. He's, you know... And then I would talk to other girls and and be like, oh, your boyfriend's really nice, and I I hope you all will be really, really careful. (laughs) Mm. 
She's an eight, you meet a uh, you meet a thirteen year old high school freshman, and she's got an eighteen year old boyfriend, and you just think, you know, the goal here is just for him not to get you pregnant and not get caught at this if he's a good guy. But then other times, you know, you meet a pregnant thirteen year old and discover that her skeevy uh, mom's boyfriend got her pregnant. Mm. And you know, okay, well, so there's a creep that needs to be in jail. Right, right. It's just hard, you know, there's really, you know, any, right? anyone and can... That's the <laughs> from a legal standpoint, we have the laws, we have, yeah. we have to have right. something that will protect the maximum mm-hmm. number of people. Right. But, you know, one of the things that I feel like is related to this is just the concept of, you know, we don't really teach girls about consent. We don't teach mm. guys about consent. Mm. Oh. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, I have a son, as I mentioned, um, mm-hmm. but he, you know, I worry for him, you know, I want to make sure that he understands like consent, you know what I mean? Cause like, yeah. I think people can not even meaning to sometimes, uh, it could go over the line. It's just because they don't know what the verbal and nonverbal cues, uh, yeah. are and they aren't getting constant cons- you know what I mean? The, the consent yeah. isn't, con- isn't continuous. Um, you know, so it just, you know, being aware of, of those things can help, you know, people who might be, you know, accidentally yeah. go over the edge and then whoops, they're there. Um, you know, if you just make sure that, you know, whatever, like, I think I've heard Dan Savage, uh, describe it as the campsite rule. Uh, you always want to leave in these kind of, uh, relationships, the campsite better than you found it, you know, the, the person, right. the younger yeah. person better than you found them. Um, yeah. So. Um, which I would say was certainly the case with my relationships. I, I look back on all of them fondly. Um, so there wasn't so, a creeper situation, as you no, described? No, I mean, cer- okay. certainly I met creepers. Mm-hmm. Uh, my older sister is quite is uh, almost six years older than I am, and I used to sometimes go visit her in college, mm. um, and she would take me out to parties. Mm. <laughs> And bars and things like that, because again, it was the eighties and over. Right. Um, <laughs> and oh yeah, it, I definitely met creepers, and you could always tell who the real creepers were because they were the guys who, even after they found out I was only you know thirteen or fourteen, were still trying to buy me drinks. Hmm. They're like, oh yeah, you're a creeper. Mm-hmm. But you know, part of the part of the whole problem too there is you know we don't believe people, especially kids. Like we don't listen to them, and even when they do tell us, we don't believe them. Right. Yeah, that's true. You're so. pretty powerless in the eyes of some people, um, or in reality, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, wow. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's pretty. Can we go deep? Yeah. No, no, no. I just I, 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 one of my questions was tell tell me about your book, um, so they don't need to ask that question anymore. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm prepared to get, as we talked about hate mail earlier, I'm prepared to get quite a bit of hate mail in this book. Okay. Um, but what But what do you think they'll be specifically objecting to, just the fact that you could have a positive feeling about this? Well, exactly. Um, and, and I've already been accused of it, of, oh, you're trying to make us um, sympathize with uh, with underage sex or, as one person says, it, child rape, which is mm. like, well... It's not actually, you know, any underage intercourse going on, and, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, if you sympathize, okay, but I'm not making you sympathize. Right, but the book hasn't even come out yet, right? Oh, yeah, but, you know, uh, with with this sort of scenario, a lot of advanced copies go out. Oh, uh, okay. They go out to the, to the media, and they also go out to people who are really active on various, you know, reader sites, like Goodreads. Mm. Um and there are systems to to get those those advanced copies out to people. Cool. Um, well, you know, if there's a list, I'd, but that's okay. I, I'll get it. <laughs> I'll get it myself somehow. Well, um, and I, unfortunately, I've sort of reached the end of mine. I had a whole stack of them at once. Ah, that's okay. Pretty much whittled <laughs> them all down. That's fine. Um, everyone should go buy it. Is there going to be an audio book? Um, there is. Did, uh, did you read the, it? No. <laughs> uh, um, no, I think somebody who actually has, like, a pleasant speaking voice uh, supported <laughs> it. Um, I can't decide if I'd want to read mine or not. I think my... Well, and that's, I'm not sure I would want to either. And then also there's just the fact that, you know, as as a former friend told me, um, uh, that my voice could cut through sheetrock. <laughs> 
I mean, so. you're not unpleasant to listen to. It's okay. I, I would really, listen to a book. You were literally the first person who's ever said that. <laughs> Maybe it's just because you're saying interesting things. I don't know. But, um, or later on playback, you'll be like, oh. Ooh, is there a filter? I can, I can right? play here. Can you, can you auto-tune? <laughs> auto-tune. I've never thought of auto-tuning an entire episode. That's a, that's a thought. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, so, uh, do uh, you, who do you let see your work after it's done? Who, who edits it? You and, and who else? Um, well, the very, very, very first draft goes to the people, bless them, <laughs> mm. <laughs> who can stand to read a first draft of mine. I have a couple of really close friends, um, uh, a shout out to Clovia, cause she's the top of the list. Um, who will look at anything, no matter how daffy, mm. um, <laughs> and bless them because they're the they're like the front lines. They're the people. They're like the canary in the coal mine, where they email you back and you're just like, "What did you do? Mm. What is this?" Um, but no, the yeah, the first people you have read it are people that you want to. You have to trust them. You have to trust that they're only going to say something bad if it's really bad, mm-hmm. and that they're going to you know try to help you get to the next stage. Mm-hmm. For me, uh, my my friend Clovia, what what makes her so amazing is that she always brings up like twenty things I haven't even thought of. Hmm. Like so, you know, that whole system of completely rediscovering the book. Like, oh, I didn't even realize that's what I was trying to do, or oh, I never even, you know, considered that element. Hmm. Which is nice, because then, yeah, you get a little more depth to the book, and you know, you have to think about it a little harder. And then, of course, the after it's after all the ugly has been knocked off, it goes to my agent. Mm. Right. But that's good that you're not as romantic uh, about your words, I guess. You know, or you're willing to kill your, your darlings or whatever they say. Um, um, although I hate that phrase. I'm like, why would you kill your darlings? Oh, God. <laughs> I think it's, it's supposed to communicate the savageness with which you should uh, eliminate. But your... I do feel like you should not always assume that just because you really like something that it's a darling and needs to be oh. cut out. Because often if you really like something, it means it's good. Interesting. Well, I have, my column has to be 24 inches of, of, of newspaper wow. every week. And it's, it's a challenge to fit everything into that. Um, so I've, I've, de- I've definitely left a lot of blood on the, on the dance floor or whatever, but yeah, um, but that's an important skill to, in fact, that's one of the most important skills to mm. have is the ability to look at your own work and go, okay, here are the 14,000 extraneous words out of this manuscript. <laughs> Yep, exactly. And yeah, you want to talk about Hemingway? You get those real, <laughs> real tight. Right. Um, have you seen that? The yeah, mine's Hem- not that tight either. No. Um, yeah. Do I not get up in the morning? But my prose. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the beauty of uh, fiction, though. I think you're allowed to, or you're encouraged, or it's it. It works well for that format to be a little more. Uh, you know, wordy. I guess. Yeah. Um. So, uh, do you do you feel like you take criticism well? Um. I. I think I'm one of those people who I go through like the, the <laughs> however many stages of grief, <laughs> you know, like denial, mm-hmm. right. anger, bargaining, acceptance. Is are those them? That sounded right to me. <laughs> okay, yeah, you get the you get the crit, you you, you know, you, or you get edits. Oh God, help! You get edits from your editor. Oh. Yeah, you know, the the person who just bought your book, mm. and like your my first gut reaction is, oh my god, you're so wrong. You don't even get this. And so I have to let myself be in that place. Like read it all the way through, mm. experience the initial denial, right? Then move on to your anger, and then you sort of start going like, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see why that would work. Okay, mm. yeah, yeah, okay. And the next thing you know, you've done the revisions, and yeah. Um, so th- that's basically my process with dealing with it, which means that I guess I'm pretty good at it. I just have to not, I can't take criticism in person, maybe, on my right. <laughs> not face to face. Right? Because it, it doesn't give me that, uh, that downtime to just be all like, okay, yeah, all right, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, which I really need. And right. it's irrational. I mean, that's the funny thing is I've been through this enough times. I mean, this is the 11th novel I've finished in my life. Really? Wow. Um, like, finished, finished. I have a whole bunch of other stuff that's in various stages of undress. Um, but, wow. But I still go through the same process where I'm irrationally 
you know, angry, and then I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Well, I'm terrible at taking criticism. Everyone will tell you that. Um, but it's only because uh, I I feel like I think about things so much before I write them, and I feel like most of the writing that I do goes on in my head long before it goes on the page. And so when it's on the page, it's really me just opening the faucet, and it's just pouring out. Um, so I feel like it's an affront to me personally when somebody doesn't like what I write, because it's like, are you serious? I thought about that for like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, go back and think for another sixteen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you need to think. Um, well, and so that's actually one of the really, really hard parts about fiction mm. is that you know, with with journalism and stuff like that, with nonfiction writing, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of it's about well, is this factually correct? Is this the most you right. know, effective way to deliver this information? Is this mm -hmm. whereas fiction is like, you know. Can I can I get you to cry? <laughs> to cry if I if I write this, can you you know. Well, can I get you to giggle while riding on the bus home? Like that's what, it's like. Can I just make you feel something? And mm. as a result, it's um. Well, you know, I have a saying that I try to deploy on people when they get freaked out. Is I say, not every book is for everybody. Mm. A lot of people have been saying that about my book. Like the, the early readers are like, oh, this book isn't for everybody. I'm like, what book is? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, not every book is going to make everybody happy because not everybody is the right audience for it. That's a great point. Yeah, and I think if you um, – I think I even saw you write something about this on your blog, but you were talking about how kind of chasing what you think someone else – especially like a publisher wants to yeah. buy, that's the quickest way to make something uninteresting because the books I love are, it's just, it's obvious that the person that wrote it was very amused with themselves when they were writing it or whatever, or they were like, Oh, that's funny. Or that's clever. I'm going to like go for it. And it was funny to them or interesting to them or whatever. It would hold their interest before it held anyone else's. So you know what I mean? Like, and I feel, I yeah. feel like that you're as a reader, you can feel when someone's chasing the audience, you know what I mean? Yeah, if, if it's particularly if you're reading for, for like a real connection. Now, there's lots of fluff books that, you know, sure. if you, even if you know it's, you know, done by, you know, flow chart or something, mm -hmm. I mean, you can still enjoy it. But, but yeah, the reality is, you, <laughs> you've got to have, you've got to have a sense that whoever wrote it, it mattered to them. Mm hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I totally, totally get that. Um, okay, so I have to ask you, we talked about this with uh, with Melanie. Uh, I, I am a journalist, as, as, we, as you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I follow AP style. I have to. It's for my job. It's like the style that yeah. I must use. And AP style is that there is no such thing as an Oxford comma. And in reality, of course, in the real world, there is such a thing as Oxford comma. What do you think? Um, my feeling about AP's position on the Oxford comma is that I refute that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there there are several classic examples that prove that the Oxford comma is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I understand why AP is opposed to it Do because you? they have a specific writing style that means that they avoid those scenarios in which. Oh, the text would be confusing without an Oxford comma. So they would find a but, different way to write it by by just the nature of the style of writing. Exactly, gotcha. because the style prohibits you from using the Oxford mm. comma. You cannot, or it would be ill advised, mm. to write a line that could be misconstrued in the absence of an Oxford comma. Interesting. Whereas, you know, for someone like me who <clears throat> vestigially is thinking in MLA format. The the real truth is, you know what my my rule book is? It's whatever my copy editor says. Right. That's a good yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. What they send you when they send you your 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 past pages to, to do your do your edits, they send you a style sheet mm. in which all the characters' names are spelled the way they're supposed to be spelled and all the town names. And then it also runs down, okay, this is how this is supposed to look. This is, you know, how this should be punctuated. And it's all spelled out. And I don't know who makes those up, and I don't care. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay, like, for instance, in, in my book, my copy editor, um, 
it says T-shirt with a capital T. Mm. I, my own self, in my own writing, I do T-shirt with a lowercase T. Um, but copy editor says uppercase T. Mm. And so that's what it is in my book. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that uh, totally makes sense. It's good to be, uh, you know, kind of unsentimental about that for sure. Just then, kind of whatever, go with whatever the style of the day is. But yeah, it's it's been yeah. A, I don't, yeah. I don't think AP is in the wrong. They just they've got their own set of priority. Okay. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned agents a little bit. What would you say about getting an agent or trying to get an agent as an author? I would say it's. It's incredibly hard and mm. painful, and it requires you to be able to take an enormous quantity of rejection. Mm. But the other thing is that you get a good agent, and they will make good connections for you, and your odds of selling a book go up. Um, and your odds of selling a book to an editor who's really excited about the book, to a you know at a house where they're really excited about the book, mm -hmm. um, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that I am inadequate to verbalize the the level of support that I've gotten from my agent. Mm. So, so yeah, it's been great. Conversely, I totally get why some people don't. I'm a hybrid author myself. Um, you know, I've got some small press books. I have some self published stuff under a pen name that I will not reveal here. Oh, wow! It's a whole Bruce Wayne Batman thing. Oh my god. <laughs> We've just gone in so many directions. I didn't. I didn't even see coming. This is um, amazing. So having experienced essentially all the different permutations of publishing, mm. now, um, it really depends upon what your goals are, what you really want, what your writing, you know, is to you. Mm. Because there are, there are plenty of people who they just want to see their book out there. And the, the glory of this modern era is that if you really just want to be able to have a copy of your book and maybe you and your 10 closest friends or family get guilted into buying a copy, um, you can do that. You can self-publish it, and it'll be great. And then you can take it to the next level. If you're someone who has a platform and you, you know, if you're one of those weird people who has like 2 million followers on Twitter and I don't know why they do, um, you can self-publish a really high-polished book and promote it to your followers and uh, use your platform to move it. Um, and then there are so many permutations of small presses. Mm. There are some really powerful small presses. There are some really, you know, pedestrian small presses. Mm. And so, yeah, depending upon what you want for your writing, mm -hmm. any of those options are good options. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you about self-publishing as well. Um, I was going to ask you if you look down on people who self-publish, but, you know, obviously. Um, no, I, I, I don't. I do think, though, mm -hmm. that there can be virtue in going through the process of getting an agent and a traditional publisher, mm -hmm. which is to say that, okay, the stuff that I self-published, you know, yeah, my good friend read it over and made sure there weren't any typos, and we tweaked a few things, and then I put it out there, and it was it was funny. <laughs> um, you know, it was an amusing thing, and it continues to amuse us, and so, you know, there's, there are a couple of iterations of it. Um, but the reality is, it's not that quality of writing. I didn't slave over it for years. A professional editor didn't slave over it. A professional copy editor and a professional line editor Nobody looked at it, um, <laughs> mm. and, and so that's that's sort of it's like um, I don't know maybe it's like maybe it's like alcohol. It's like you can get really you know you can get moonshine, and moonshine will get you drunk, which I can vouch for as I've got several jars of it. <laughs> um, and as long as you don't you know accidentally get the methanol off of it mm. and drink that, you're probably not going to go blind. But it's not like quality. Well, it's not you know. Hasn't been aged for you know ten years in oak casks and um, and so a lot of that it means that for the self publisher it's all that is on them mm. they have to do the purification they have to you know make sure that it's the best book that they can possibly produce and of course not a lot of people do because mm. it's hard because it requires you to take criticism and requires you to go like yeah okay that kind of sucks I better fix that. Mm -hmm. 
Right, right. Um, now, can you say anything else about this uh, mysterious self-published uh, <laughs> series that no. we're learning about this, no, like a genre or, or would No, and nothing? it's not that I'm ashamed of it. It's just that I don't want to muddy the waters. <laughs> Muddy the waters. Interesting. Uh, you know, it is. It's the Bruce Wayne factor where I'm like, I just don't want these two identities to get, <laughs> you know, crossways with each other. Interesting. So do you think you'll ever reveal it, or is this forever? Oh, I'm sure somebody will just figure it out. Somebody I mean, will figure it out. Interesting. I, I'm sure. I, there are no secrets. In the Internet age, <laughs> age, you cannot keep a secret. Like, it will come out. Right. Interesting. And that's why I say I'm not ashamed because um, I never would have published it, you know, had I been ashamed because I know that eventually somebody will be like, hey. <laughs> I mean, you you put it out into the world, so obviously you wanted to, someone yeah. to read it. So. Oh, and that's just it. But I wanted uh, – there's a very niche group for whom this stuff is uh, – is, no, not dinosaur porn, so don't even ask. I didn't even know that existed before you just said those what? words. Um, oh my God, if I, oh, anyway, but my point being, yeah, no, it's uh, it's just a whole unconnected thing. But it really did. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's the onus is on the writer when they self-publish to produce the best mm. books that they possibly can. Interesting. And obviously, some people do, and other people don't. Right, right. Um, now, as far as pitching goes, like pitching yeah. stories and, and novels, and well, I guess you don't really have to pitch a novel as much because it's just there. You know, you just but, but you still have to pitch it, right? Well, I mean, no. In fact, that's what the whole that's what the whole you know getting an agent is about is mm. an endless series of novel pitches where you're mm. just trying to get somebody to go, yeah, that looks interesting. I'll take a look. Right. Um, and then after that, you know, you writing up pitches to go to the editor for it, mm. but also. I mean, you still, after you sell the first book, you have to pitch the next one. Mm-hmm. Right, because then they're going to be like, all right, what else you got? Yep. Um, totally. Wow. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, do you read the book first and then see the movie? Do you see the movie first and then read the book? I think it depends on what it is. Like, I think I'd have to have an example before I'd know. Though I can think of a few examples where I thought the movie was better than the book. Mm-hmm. I know you're not supposed to say that, but I can think of a few examples. Like, what would be an example? Oh, you're going to make me so fine. Fight Club. The movie was better than the book. Oh, my God. I said it. What? I said it. I I, I don't care if it's blasphemy. I don't. <laughs> well, it's not blasphemy. You're just wrong. I mean, so it's a huge <laughs> difference. Um, okay, you can have your own opinion. <laughs> that's I'm true. That's now. true. That's true. No, and... And that's what I mean, is you're not supposed to say that because nobody wants to hear that about a book that they love, that somebody thought the movie was better. Oh, what what a Philistine. But what do you, uh, do you like Chuck Palahniuk, though? Yeah, I do. I just, oddly enough, I, I really, I thought the movie was better. Well, I mean, it's a great movie. I, I've owned it at least three times in different VHS and DVD formats. Uh, right, different formats. God, that's how they get you. Exactly. Rebuy everything. But, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a great movie. I can, I can see how you get there with that one, though. I mean, they're both great. Well, and, and like I said, it's not like I could give you a, 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 an analysis. It's just my gut feeling was I really enjoyed the movie a lot more than the book. Mm -hmm. Which is not to say I didn't enjoy the book because, obviously, you know, I wouldn't have ever gone to see the movie if I hadn't read the book. Hmm. Oh, but you read the book first, and then you saw the movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. See, I did the opposite. Um, but that's interesting, yeah. I guess that's... I mean, there's a few I can think of that it's up there. I mean, The Shining, for example, I, I don't think it's like... They're just different things, you know, and I love but, them Yeah, both. they're... It's like... Oh, um... Oh, did you hear what uh, Max Burke said about World War Z? Mm -mm. I didn't like the movie. I liked the book a lot, well, but go ahead. Just, as he said, basically they bought the title of my book. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah. that, to it was, that was so spot on. I was like, yes, that's exactly what happened. Is They just wanted to use the name, and so they paid him however much they paid him to be able to call their movie World War Z. But that was so disappointing because I thought they were going to do it like the book, and it was it was really cool how the book was done, I thought. Yeah, so. no, the, the book is magnificent. Oh, yeah. It's like one of those, uh, I don't know, they just go in so many, like, it's like a pistolary in parts. It's, you know, from different perspectives and different people. And this was just like, Brad Pitt is this guy. And it's like, what? Right? Brad Pitt is Brad Pitt. <laughs> in Brad Pitt zombie yeah. movie. Um, yeah. But, yeah. 
No, I, yeah, that, there's a couple like that I can think of. But you so. notice the common element here. What? Oh, 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 I get it. I just matched it up. Okay, great. I, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's response. I can, I can see how you get there. Um, so, uh, but yeah, no, generally I agree. The, the, the book is better. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then if you see the movie too, then it kind of paints the picture for you and you don't have to like, it robs you of the experience of, you know. Yeah, for me, that's, that's why I almost always, if it's something I'm really interested in, I will read the book first hmm. because I want to have the real experience. And then if the movie is kind of close, it can kind of, or you can just go away to your happy place and sort of like, you know, intellectually masturbate in the book. <laughs> With the scenes and everything, you know, superimposed. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. I would say this is a classic case. Uh, here's an example of this. Um, are you familiar with uh, Mark Halpern's The Winner's Tale? I, I know Mark Halpern. I don't know The, the Winner's Tale. Um, it, but they, they made a terrible movie of it. Oh. But it's the kind of movie where when you're watching it, you just sort of zone out and think about the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's hilarious. Um, yeah. yeah, but as soon as I saw High Fidelity, I could not oh. think that Jack Black was the guy. Right. The store. You know, yeah, like, like, and yeah, I was reading was... the book around the same time anyway, and I just happened to halfway through see the movie before I was done with the book, and I was like, I can't. He's, he's just Jack Black now. <laughs> I didn't think he was Jack Black before, but he's, of course he's Jack Black now. So It really does. It totally colors your expectations. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I said we talk a little bit about music. Uh, oh, yeah. And you mentioned that we were going to be talking about Romstein, which, <laughs> which kind of blew my hair back a little bit. Um, so I haven't thought about Romstein Ramst- since like probably college in any real way when my roommate Jonathan has been on a couple times. We used to play uh, video games in his room, and he would play Romstein oh, yeah. during like these fight games or whatever. So I have a distinct memory. Memories of you know Duhast and Engel and all these uh, yeah. you know, circa the Matrix soundtrack, uh, all that. Yeah. Um, so uh, now it's interesting to me that you said that because do you speak German? Um, I only speak Rammstein German. Interesting. Um, according to my coworker, um, I have about a toddler's level of German. German. <laughs> Like if you you know if you abandoned me in the middle of a German speaking country, I would probably make it out alive. Oh, cool. Um, well, they, a lot know, of them I, speak English, though. So. Well, well, and that's what I mean. I, I, that's why I wanted to specify in a place where there's only German speaking. I, I would still probably it, I would make it out alive. They would think that I was an imbecile, mm. but I would make it out alive. Right. Um, but yeah, that's the only German I speak is Rammstein. <laughs> that's funny. Well, I was reading. But they also have several great songs that will help you learn German. Oh sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the even Du Hast is like, isn't it a play on words in German that yeah. you can only really yeah. understand because, if you know the uh, language? Hate and have yeah. are essentially, you know, pronounced the same in German. Exactly. Um, but you know, you've got like songs where you learn how to count from one to ten. <laughs> Are you into boxing at all? Boxing? Uh, yeah. Not really, no. Uh, me either. But they have the world's greatest boxing song ever. Boxing? Interesting. Yeah, the the name of the song is Zana. Oh. And it, it's about boxing. And so part of it is the counting uh, to ten. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, mm. fünf. Interesting. Like even auch neun, aus, out, because, you know, you're counting... Huh. Wow. Okay. I just know so that one. Be, uh, yeah. I just know that one Def Leppard song where they have the beginning of <laughs> German. Um, <laughs> I think that's German. <laughs> P- Pigeon German. Um, right? I don't know. <laughs> but are there any other German bands that you like besides Rammstein? Um, not re- I mean, I, I never really think of stuff in terms of like. You know, nationalities, but right. uh, Apocalyptica, are they German? Yeah, but they're an instrumental band, though, right? Well, exactly, but they're great. Of course, yeah, they did those Metallica covers that were really good. Uh-huh. Um, oh. And, of course, you know, you have your old standbys like Kraftwerk. <laughs> of course, who could forget? Um, so, uh, Taco, also, um, putting on the Ritz. Um <laughs> 
I think he was German. <laughs> I could be wrong. Right? I can't remember. <laughs> um, so we, we've also interacted a little bit about ACDC, and it's, oh, it's yeah. been interesting lately what's happened with them, because now it is basically just Angus. Uh, yeah, the right? the only one left. Um, cause I mean, the, it's sort of... Yeah. It's like when when you have a band that you think of as a band, and then the, the the layers of the onion are peeled away, and you realize all along the band has sort of basically been this one guy. I mean, I guess we should have always known it was really just Angus's band, because I mean, he's the, the whole schoolboy thing, and he's like at the well, huge statue. I mean, you know, and, but you, you know. also just look at you know the the writing credits. Oh sure, yeah. And he's obviously the musician in the bunch. Um, right, right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But I, mean, I still miss Bon Scott. Who doesn't? Yeah, no, let's, yeah. Let's have a moment of silence for that. But, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, Axl Rose is interesting, but I don't really think he's, he, I mean, he makes sense for that band, though. If anyone's going to be their replacement he has singer, the I guess. Power for yeah, it. exactly. And he fits with this style and the songs and everything. I'm sure he, you know, he was influenced yeah. by, by, you know, Bon Scott and Brian Johnson. So, you know, it makes sense. Um, you know, Brian Johnson, like, you know, he made Back in Black. So, I mean, that was kind of, he, he came out of the gate yeah. so strong that, like, I, I feel like even the people that, that don't like him, which I never really understood. Like, I never really understood no. the hate uh, that people had for It's like Bon is dead. I wish he wasn't dead, too, believe me. But, like, <laughs> but, if do you but, want this yeah. band to continue? Because somebody has to sing the the words to the songs. So. <laughs> and he wasn't bad. He wasn't like that uh, random first uh, lead singer that they had right. before Bon Scott that was terrible. I mean, it wasn't like whatever that guy's name was. <laughs> like, it, you know, there there, there, there it, are people that would suck and did suck at it. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's just it. Is, you know, they it, back in black is obviously proof that he was capable of of being, you know, the lead singer. He was mm. capable of being the front man. Yeah. Sure. But, like, I think people miss the, like, you know, because with Bon Scott, of course, there was that kind of, you know, romantic uh, side to him. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, he had a heart, absolutely. you know. You know, you've got, like, yeah, you've got, like, the whole, uh, you know, hard luck guy and ride yeah. on. Yeah. You know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's very romantic. Absolutely, kind of the yeah, absolutely. But like Brian was a little more mechanical with it, and that's fine. And he made it work for what he was doing. But I never, I mean, I never felt that like kind of street poet raw emotion. No, thing, like with no, Bond, he's you know much I mean? more. He's much more. Yeah, I hate to say working class because Bond was very working class. Oh yeah, but, uh, he was more of a working class poet. Yeah, sure. you don't you don't get that feeling with Brian Johnson. Yeah, he was, yeah. by the way, really really tiny. What? Oh, Brian Johnson. Yeah, he's really tiny. I have a friend of mine um, who works in the building where one of his business investments is. Hmm. And so I have a picture of her with him that I, that I just thought I was I'm like, what the hell? He's really short. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but yeah, no, what is it? What, but is Back in Black your favorite album you said? I think I think you mentioned Yeah, that. well, you know, it's, it's such a great album. Mm-hmm. Right, you it's, know the whole as a complete work, it's mm-hmm. so brilliant. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you don't ever. I always listen to it in order. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's a great it's one to listen so to. Order. Yeah, it's very well programmed. It flows from one song to another. You know, all the songs are memorable. There's no filler. Um, nope. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that one. Um, I like I like uh, Powerage is probably my favorite one from the Bron, oh. bon, bon Scott era. But I mean, so many of those are great. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it's hard to pick a favorite, but you know that has some of the some of the key ones on it. Riff Raff and uh, you know a couple of those other classics. Yeah. Uh, what was that one? That was it was the inspir- It was in the Beavis and Butthead movie. What was that song? Uh, what? I don't know. Uh, gone shooting. That's what it was. Oh, that was in, okay. yeah. And actually, the I I found out later that the theme to Beavis and Butthead is actually modeled off of Gone Shooting. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah. Anyway. So like I said, you know, I, I love Dirty Deeds, but yeah, Black and Black just is, as a masterwork is is amazing. Oh yeah. But still, my favorite, and and literally one of my all time favorite songs, not just of ACDC, but in the world, is Jailbreak. Oh yeah, that's I, I, God, I love my that life song. here. I, I yeah, no, I love that one. Um, yeah, I like that's a good story song too. I feel like that really puts a yeah. puts a picture in your head. Um, but who else, who else have you been listening to lately musically? Um, you know, I I love the Rainmakers. 
who are sort of a Kansas City institution, mm. although they're very big in Norway also. Wow. Um, they tell a lot of stories, and they're, they describe themselves as sort of like um, drunk hillbilly music, which isn't totally true, mm. um, but very sort of rough around the edges, you know, rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, cool. Um, thank you so much for, for talking to me. I mean, I, I wish I could uh, think of more things to ask you because you've got so much interesting things to say. Um, but um, uh, where can people find you? Like, where do you, where can you find um, online? My website's probably the easiest place to start, which is uh, bringgreenwood.com. That's got links to my blog and my social media and really almost any other tedious thing, you know, anybody might want. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before um, we get going? Just, like, uh, if you're in the market for a book that is apparently, um, you know, going to be controversial, they tell me uh, all the ugly and wonderful things that's coming out on August ninth. Cool, cool. Well, um, if it's available, I will also plug the um, audio book um, at the beginning. Of the um, it should be. I don't know if it will be right at August 9th, but I know they're recording it right now. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Well, yeah, everyone should definitely go check that out and go read everything else that <laughs> she's willing to reveal <laughs> the, that, the, her authorship of at, the, at this juncture. Maybe maybe the next time you're on, you can uh, maybe it'll be after the, the news breaks of, of the mystery. Um, <laughs> and you'll have to deal with the, with the scrutiny of, of, uh, of your public. Perfect. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much uh, for talking to me. It's been a lot of fun. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Cool. Uh, have a good night. Thank you so much. You too. <laughs> Bye-bye.